Yeah, it mostly sometimes two, two or three a day. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, and I wonder sometimes about the. You, know. you get paid by the word, right? No, I don't get paid. By the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just uh, a story last night. And one of the things to talk about is it's, it's one of these little stealth stories that's crept out, at least for me it was stealth, because it was sort of off my radar, which is that in the last decade, um, U.S. reliance on OPEC oil exports has really drastically declined, and that more and more as we look to the future, we're going to see an almost entirely domestic source of fossil fuels, so maybe including Canada or maybe some Latin America. Right. Yeah. And I, I somehow missed this story. Yes. <laughs> Has this, has this been underreported, or do you think this think is so. not particularly significant, or this is... Yeah, no, no, it is significant, to, uh, but, and, and it has been underreported, I think. Uh, we're not as hostage to oil sheet films as we were, and the other, the, the other, the real story, the story of domestic availability of fossil fuels using unconventional means, this frack is, right. it's a big deal, and it's oil and gas, not just oil, and not just gas. And offshore too, you know, and there are big sources in the Gulf and elsewhere. So the prospects are that, that we're going to be much more. Actually, the Times did have a story. It was on the page one. Yeah, yeah, yeah page yeah. one, like three days ago. Yeah, well, that, but right, also kind of a catch up story. These two things all of a sudden. Yeah, I think, you again. know, the Economist has written about the Times, but it, I, I guess um, it hasn't, I don't think it's affected our Middle East politics yet, in the sense that, you know, we, Places we don't necessarily have to rely on as much are still part of our you know, priority system. So uh, the, the the big story, as I was saying, though, is there is a lot of oil. There's a lot more oil than we thought. The idea of peak oil is, is really kind of a fantasy because as the price gets higher, it becomes more. You can act, oil that was not profitable becomes profitable. So you're constantly expanding that realm of the, pro, the possible and the profitable. Like about two trillion potential barrels the Athabasca tar sands. It's yeah. an extraordinary number. And then, you know, there, uh, and I wrote about you know, I wrote about that pipeline, the Keystone Pipelines, the, the conventional environmental wisdom is shut down the pipeline. And I looked as thoroughly as I could at trends, the data on where the oil would flow anyway, the oil is going to get extracted anyway, it will get to a market anyway. And the pipeline to me became a distraction, especially because the environmental groups we're trying to lay this on Obama as Obama's decision. And so they're actually damaging a friend of the environment and Obama with this kind of make Obama. They had a demonstration at the White House, stop the pipeline, stop the pipeline. When in fact, if you want to stop greenhouse gas emissions, there's very little evidence that that pipeline or, or that any American policy would actually modulate the use of that resource. So it's like, so why are we doing that? What, what's the value of that operation. Now there are, there are those, Bill McKibben, an old friend of mine, and I disagree completely. He was very angry with me for writing what I wrote, and, and um, but I do just disagree. Now, I'm kind of like a pragmatist in the sense I operate in the world that exists, and I look at the things that could happen realistically, and, and I um, have, you know, I make my choices about policies that I think make sense based on the activist brain. I would like to change the world, which is great, but not my style. Too much work. It's good. Have you read Jürgen's new book yet? No, not yet. I haven't had time. It's 800 pages. But I had someone else read it for me. That's, that's the other great thing about Jürgen's new book. Daniel Jürgen.